Good morning and welcome to BFC Live. My name is Ben Bumpus. I am one of the pastors here on staff at Bethany First Church of the Nazarene. And BFC Live is the place to hear inspiring stories. We hope they're inspiring and important updates about all things going on in the beautiful community that is Bethany First Church, a beautiful community which you at home watching are a part of. So thank you so much for joining us today. One of my favorite parts about BFC Live every week, and I say it every week because it's true, is the incredible guests that we have on. And this week we have my co-pastor and one of my best friends, maybe my best friend, I'll say it, Wow! in the entire world, the BFC lead youth pastor. That is Brighton Schmidt. Brighton, welcome to the show. Hey, thank you so much uh, for having me. It is an honor and a privilege uh, to be here. Thank you, Ben. Well, and we're glad to have you. And I love the brown and blue shirt you got going on. It's a, Those are real complimentary much. colors. Yeah, I like it. I appreciate it. Wouldn't have that. expected it, but it's a good look. Thank you. It is. Brighton, we have got something cool coming up. You, me, Pastors Ashley, Pastor Tiffany, a whole bunch of awesome leaders, a lot of you, and some incredible students, a lot of them, are going on a really cool trip. Tell me about it. Absolutely. Uh, we have our winter retreat coming up here in two weekends, January 19th through the 21st. Um, it truly is an incredible weekend. Probably the closest thing uh, that we do to camp. It's like mini camp, a weekend camp. It is awesome. It's at a New Life Ranch in Colkert, Oklahoma, Northeast Oklahoma, about five miles from Arkansas. Beautiful area, very Ozarky, uh, terrible uh, cell coverage. So you can't be on your phone. The kids can't be on their phone. It's a great time uh, to get away and just grow closer with God, grow closer with one another. We play a ton of fun games, um, have an uh, amazing work worship and our speaker this year we're very very excited oh, about yeah. many of you probably know his name um he was our former youth pastor That's he was right. a youth we pastor youth. Uh, which is a long time ago at this point <laughs> uh he was a youth pastor before i got here before ben got here his name is david bond we're so excited to have him um our juniors and seniors are upperclassmen uh they most recently or they were the last group of students who had him so for them it's kind of a throwback a lot it of fun is. so we're really looking forward to the weekend now uh, we ask that you would uh pray for the weekend with us absolutely um, that it would be a powerful weekend. Uh, if you have any students that want to go, um, tell them to bring their friends, sign them up. It's going to be a really, really um, impactful and incredible weekend. Absolutely. It's my favorite weekend that we do yeah, at BFC awesome. Youth. It is an incredible time, and we would love to see your students there. That is 7th through 12th grade that we take on this retreat. So if you know a 7th through 12th grader, please let them know. You can sign up at our link in our Instagram bio, bfc.youth is our Instagram account. Or if you need the link, you can text Brighton or myself, reach out to us, email us, however it is, and we would love to set you up. I was going to say one more thing about yeah. it. Um, if you you know are struggling maybe to come up with a payment or anything like that, we have scholarships available. Never let money be uh, a reason that you don't go on this event. Uh, we have so many generous people in this church who have given uh, for students to go to things like this winter retreat. Absolutely. We, we are way more passionate about connecting your student with God than we are about connecting ourselves with a little extra money. Amen. Right? We are passionate about those connections that we get to make at retreats. They are a once in a lifetime kind of experience, once every year for us. Um, but we really, really, really would love to see your students there. We're also passionate about connecting with God and with you at home watching. So there's going to be a QR code popping up on the screen right about now. You can scan that with your phone, fill out prayer requests, or if you're interested in taking the next steps in your faith walk with Jesus, you can fill all that stuff out there. And a pastor at this church may Maybe myself, maybe Brighton, maybe Corey Hooper. We'll get back to you this week about that. We would love to connect with you in that way. And to stay up to date on all things BFC that are going on, please follow us on our social media accounts, Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. Well, Brighton, it is a special day because it is the first new series of the new year. And this new series is called The Call. And today is The Call to Repentance, which can sound kind of like a big and kind of scary thing, but it doesn't have to be, right? Absolutely. It doesn't have to be. I think when we think of repentance, uh, we can think about, you know, uh, experiencing that with another human being, maybe mm -hmm. a friend, um, someone like that. And it can feel big because when you're going to someone and you're asking for forgiveness and you're telling them, hey, you know, I messed up. I hope that we're okay. I hope that you can forgive me. Um, and I'm going to change my life 180 degrees. I'm going to go a different way that can be big because you don't know what their reaction is going to be. But when we do repentance with God, the crazy thing is God delights in showing mercy. God is excited to forgive us. Um, God is excited um, that we are repenting and wanting to change our life. And God is ready to help with that. It's a different kind of attitude, a different mindset with God. Amen. Beautifully said, Brighton. You should try this pastor thing out. That Thank was, you so much. That was really impressive. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, we believe it's going to be an incredibly impactful series led by Pastor Rick today. So thank you so much for joining us. You are loved, you are prayed for, and we would love to worship with you.
Come on, let's give the Lord praise in His awesome and powerful name. We call upon that name today. Call the name. Let's sing. Call the name. Call the name. Call the name. Jehovah. Oh, the
Come on, church, let's give him praise for all that he's done. Hallelujah. In the morning when the sun is rising Another day to tell of all your kindness When I think of your goodness Oh, I sing for joy, I speak your name In the evening when the night is falling When troubles rise and I can't hear you calling I don't have to worry
Do I look a little confused? Don't you love this? I feel like we've been praying together for the last several minutes, don't you? I met Sheena today. It's her first Sunday at BFC. A delightful young lady. Sheena, I'm glad you're here. And it may be that there's others of you who are saying, this is my first time. I'm glad that you're here. There's a connect card under your armrest. We'd love for you to fill it out. Drop it in a connect box when you leave. Um, and please come again. We'd love to answer any questions that you have about the church. Communicate to us in any way that you want to. We'll get back to you. Thank you for your giving. And you can give many ways. One of the ways is you can drop it in that same connect box when you leave at every door. But I need to tell you that we just finished 2023 and we met our budgets for 2023. I think we got to celebrate. You've been faithful in your giving. We are always thankful for your faithfulness and giving that allows this church to do what it continues to do. It's a special morning. We got kids in the room today. And uh, I would love for all the kids to come and kneel along the altars. Would you guys step out from where you are now? Parents, if you wanna come with them, you're welcome to. But all the kids, would you come? I wanna pray for you this morning. Just kneel along the altars here. Teens, if you wanna come, you're welcome to as well. Uh, let's just kind of fill up around. And we're gonna pray and any parents who wanna come, you're welcome to join them as well. If some of you kids wanna join me up here, you could come up here and stand with me. I would be okay with that too. I'd love to have you, okay, yep. And I wanna take a minute and I wanna pray for you, okay? Honored and blessed to pray for you today, yep. Come here, Bailey, yep. Mm. Are we not blessed with these children? God has trusted us, hasn't he? You wanna come over here? So let's join together and pray for our kids. A great way to start our new year here at BFC. Don't you agree? Well, Lord, I look around and I'm just amazed at all the children that you've entrusted to our care. And so we begin a new year with them, asking you to bless them. So thankful that they're in worship with us today. And Father, I lift them to you. There's a lot in their lives. They face so much. Headed back to school tomorrow, many of them. We just want them to love you, to know you. I pray for every children's pastor, every children's worker, every volunteer who helps with our kids and our youth, Lord. Let us guide our children in the way that you would have us to. Let their eyes always be to your word, their heart always to your will, their feet always toward your sanctuary to worship you. Bless them, I pray. Keep them safe. Keep their hearts true to you. They all have concerns. And so right now, Lord, as every child around the altar just says, Lord, would you help me with this? Would you answer this prayer? I know that you hear them pray. And so answer, I pray, Father, the deep prayers of their hearts. We love them. We thank you for them. We pray your blessings on them. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay. See you later. Okay. I thought it was a pretty cool role in myself. What did you think? Oh. You know, I wonder today, 
as we enter a new year, if there's anybody saying this morning, Rick, I think God's talking to me as I start a new year. Anybody in the room like that? Maybe God is uh, calling somebody to volunteer somewhere. You feel like God is saying, I want you to serve. I want you to give back. I want you to find somewhere to give to others, you know? I wonder if there's somebody saying, I feel like God is calling me to a deeper prayer life and one-on-one -on -one time with God in the Word. I feel like God is saying to me, I miss time with you, and I want you to spend more time with me. I wonder if there's somebody saying, I feel like there's somebody that I need to forgive. It's not that I'm opposed, it's just not easy. Or it's more than just saying the words. There's a process. I'm trying to figure that out. Or maybe God's calling somebody to make things right with somebody else. There's, there's something between me and somebody, and I just need to help make that right. Maybe there's somebody saying, I think there's a part of my life that God wants me to surrender. I've held on to some things. I mean, a lot of stuff I've just given to God, but there's, there's an area in my life that I just keep holding on to. And I feel like God's saying, let it go. I was on the phone with a guy this week. I don't know him very well. First thing he says to me, I guess you heard our big news. I said, no. He said, we're, we're making a transition yeah, he said, we feel like that we've heard from God and he's clearly made his will known to us. I said, man, I am thankful that you've heard from God. I love it when people tell me they've heard from God because I don't ever want to be at that point in my life where God doesn't speak to me any longer. Do you? I like it when God's talking to me. And so I think I'm asking you, what's God calling you to do? Where's God calling you to go? What is God calling you to walk away from? What is God calling you to repent of? Where's God calling you to serve? Who is God calling you to spend time with who doesn't know Jesus? Who is God calling you to invest in? I'm just going to make this person a priority in my life. I'm going to be there for them. I'm going to spend time with them, and I believe they'll see the Jesus in me. I don't know how to make it any more simple, so I'll just stay with the simple. You ready? God calls people. He speaks to us in various ways. And we find ourselves in the season of epiphany, which is all about God's manifestation, God revealing himself, God making himself known, making Jesus known. And in these few passages that we're going to study over the next few weeks, there's another common thread that I see, and that is that not only does God make himself known, but he makes his will known. He says to people like you and me, this is where I want to lead you. This is what I want you to do. This is what I want you to give your life to. God not only makes himself known, but he makes his will known and he calls us to the life he desires us to live. So the Bible is just full, I mean full, of examples of God calling people like he called Noah to build a really big ark. It was weak, but you're right, it was an ark. He calls Abraham to be the father of the nation. He calls Moses to lead his people. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm stepping over hundreds here. I'm, I'm just, it's a very broad stroke. I mean, I'm, I'm leaving out hundreds of examples as I go. He called Samuel to a life of service. He called David to be a king. He called Isaiah to be a prophet. He called Jonah to warn a city. And again, I'm jumping over hundreds. He called Peter and Andrew and James and John to be disciples along with eight others. He calls Paul to be a missionary. God calls people. I don't want you to get hung up on the vocation thing. 
well, Rick, you got this calling on your life. I mean, you're, you, you, you've got a, a vocational calling of full-time Christian service. I believe I do too. But I believe that God calls every follower of Jesus. Let me be more specific. I believe God is calling every follower of Jesus. It's a continual conversation, which I think is one of the reasons that one of the best questions that we as believers can ask one another is, what do you sense God is saying to you in this season of your life? What's God saying to you? I believe God's always speaking, always calling, always talking. What do you sense God is saying to you right now? So it takes us to our passage today, the Gospel of Mark, chapter 1. You want to open a phone or a Bible? Mark, chapter 1. Do you, do you know who wrote the Gospel of Mark? Mark. Probably better known in the book of Acts as John Mark. He was a co-worker with Paul in planting all his churches. And he becomes a partner with Simon Peter in his preaching ministry. In fact, you're going to love to hear this, Okay. What, what he does, what we believe he does, is he takes all of Peter's preaching and all of his sharing about his eyewitness experiences with Jesus because Peter was right there shoulder to shoulder with Jesus. And Mark takes all of that stuff that Simon Peter shares with him and he forms it into the book of Mark, beautifully, into the gospel of Mark. That's where we get Mark, the gospel of Mark. He, he, he has all this time spent with Simon Peter and he hears about all of these eyewitness experiences with Jesus and, and he hears all of Peter's sermons and he takes all of that and he gathers it and he beautifully organizes it into the gospel of Mark. That's how we get the gospel. And here's how he starts it in chapter one, verse one. He says, the beginning of the good news about Jesus, the Messiah, the son of God. Did you hear it? Okay, I'll say it again. The beginning of the good news about Jesus, the Messiah, the son of God. As written in Isaiah, the prophet. So what does Isaiah write for telling the future? I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way. A voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. Now, he not only quotes uh, Isaiah, but he also quotes the book of Exodus and he also quotes Malachi, the prophet. Here's what I want you to understand, that the gospel is bound to the promises of God in the Old Testament. And so, for example, Isaiah uh, chapter 23 talks about there will be a messenger who will go ahead of you as you exodus from the Egyptian slavery through the wilderness and into Canaan. And, and then when you get to the book of Exodus, there's this talk about a new exodus. And when you get to Malachi, there's this thing that this Messiah is going to go before you, and what he is saying is, this is all happening now. There is a new exodus. God is going to free his people once for all through the coming of Jesus, who will usher in the kingdom of God. So let's go to the next one. And so John the Baptist appeared. That's the forerunner. That's the messenger. That's the one who's going to prepare the way. He appeared in the wilderness, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Oh, I want to let that soak in. He came preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. I got this place I go to breakfast, and on the senior menu, they let me order half a waffle and crispy bacon and an egg over medium well. And that's important, the medium well. And, and when it hits my table... I take the syrup and I pour it into each little cavity of the waffle. And then I eat my bacon and my egg because I want the syrup to soak into the waffle. Brunch sound good to anybody? That's what I want to let happen right here. I want you to let this soak in for a minute. He was preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And Mark says, the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to him. That's hyperbole. It's like saying everybody was there. 
But, but it's also like saying thousands came. They were confessing their sins. They were baptized by him in the Jordan River. So what was John like? Well, he was a, he was a rugged man. He, he wore clothing made of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locust and wild honey. He simply lived on the natural resources of the land. He was a Elijah-type prophet. When you went to see John the Baptist, he wasn't mainstream by any means. And this was his message. Lean in. Don't you want to hear his message? Here we go. After me comes the one more powerful than I, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. And at that time, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee. And he was baptized by John in that Jordan. And just as Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven being open, torn open, and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. It was a, a thin place. And a voice came from heaven, you are my son whom I love. With you, I am well pleased. This is the word of God for the people of God. And the people said, thanks be to God. I've been having this conversation lately. It just seems like it's appropriate from time to time. And I've had it with a few groups of people. And it's that there is this lie that is often believed in our society that says freedom it's when you do what you want to do, where you want to do it, with who you want to do it. That's, that's freedom. So if you really want to be free, you just, freedom is all about just, I, I can do whatever I want, whenever I want, with whoever I want. It just, I, I, I just do what I want to do. That's, that's what it means to experience freedom. That's free. But the scripture tells us it's a lie. I remember the first real drug addict I ever had a conversation with. I was younger, much younger. I was a youth pastor in Kansas City. And he says to me, he says, I don't do anything I want to do. I do whatever drugs and my addiction tells me I'm going to do. I find myself standing in the most dangerous part of Kansas City at three in the morning not because I want to be there, but because my addiction tells me I have to be there. And I'm buying drugs. I want to spend time with my kids, but I don't get to spend time with my kids because my addiction tells me you don't get to do that. And so what, what, what seemed like, I'm going to do what I want. I'm going to do drugs. That's, that's free. It actually became bondage. And he saw himself as a slave. It's like a person who is immoral in a marital relationship and it results in a divorce and now I'm no longer able to live in my own home and I'm no longer able to have my kids with me all the time because when I did what I wanted to do with who I wanted to do it, it resulted in bondage. It's a lie. That's not freedom. And what the scriptures teach me is that Real freedom comes when I submit. Get that. I know it sounds wild, doesn't it? It's like a paradox. When I submit to the will of God, that's the freest I'll ever be. So God never said, no, we're going to avoid these things because I do not want you to have fun. I do not want you to have pleasure. I do not want you to enjoy yourself. I don't want your life to be good. So I'm going to say, no, you can't do that stuff. No, the only reason God ever says let's avoid these things is because they bound you, and I want you to be free. And the way to freedom is not doing what I want and what I want. The way to freedom is submitting to the will of God. And that's where John the baptizer takes the people of Israel. So you might say, okay, who's John? Well, John is this forerunner, this messenger who is going to prepare the way for Jesus' coming, for the Messiah's coming. So N.T. Wright, in his epistle, and rather in his commentary on, on the gospel of, of Mark, says that there's a joke in England. 
And the joke is that wherever, wherever the queen goes, she smells fresh paint. I know, that's got you holding your side. Great joke, N.T., right? Thanks. They laughed a little in first service. And N.T. Wright goes on to say, and that's what John is doing. Preparing people for the coming of royalty. Getting everything, everybody ready. Because God is going to come and dwell in their midst. So they're waiting, they're waiting, they're waiting for the Messiah. In fact, they're praying, they're praying, they're praying for the Messiah to come. But what they were not expecting was a prophet who was going to come to them and say, okay, you need to repent in order to prepare for his coming. Or were they thinking that? So let me ask you, you with me right now? You looking at me? If you knew, and you don't, but if you knew, you can't, there's no way. But if you knew, it's not possible. But if somehow you knew that Jesus' second coming was this week, we talked a lot during Advent about the fact that Jesus will come again. He ascended into the heavens, but he's coming back just like you saw him go. And, and there's gonna be judgment and everything else. And if somehow, you can't, I know. You don't, I know. But let's just assume, just humor me. Somehow you know that he's coming this coming week. Do you think there's anybody in the room who might do a little bit of repenting? Got two honest boys right here. Thank you for raising your hand. Well, I mean, you know, Rick, why wouldn't you? I mean, just make sure, right? Just shore things up. I mean, you don't want to be stupid. I mean, if you know for sure, I mean, why wouldn't you just say, hey, let's just go over this, Jesus, real quick and make sure I'm okay with you. So why don't we talk about repentance and let's talk about what you repent of. And let's talk about what all of that looks like because John came preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sin. So, Joe, do you mind joining me for a minute real quick? <clears throat> so, um, I, I, I thought maybe if I could give you a kind of a picture, it might be helpful. And so if you want to step it up, we would all appreciate it, Joe. So if you'll stand right here for me, that'd be great. So um, I'm a little older than you, aren't I? A little bit. A little bit. So, but anyway, still yet, you're a great guy. Thank you. Very caring. Well, let you represent God and I'll represent me, okay? Okay, so I know that's a tough calling. So when we think about repentance, what do you repent of? You can only repent of one thing. What is that? Sin. Okay. So, so when we think about defining sin, sin would be, according to Scripture, and, and, and John Wesley did a great job helping us form language to understand sin. He would say it would be an intentional or a willing transgression against what I know to be God's will, okay? So sin is a willing, intentional transgression against what I know to be the will of God, all right? So here's the deal. You can never sin without turning your back on God. If you willingly sin, there's something you have to do. Turn your back on God. You're not going that direction, you're going this direction. And so if Joe represents God, and I've made a decision today that I'm I know this is not God's will. I know that God is saying, no, Rick, this is not what I want for you. And I'm going to say, you know what? I hear you, but I'm doing it anyway. In order to do that, I have to just, I'm turning my back. I'm not going that direction. I'm going this direction. I know you're there, but I'm not, I'm going here. So repentance is when I stop and I turn and I go the other direction. Th think about it with me. Today, are you turned toward God? Is your, is your life, your heart, your soul, everything about you 
turn toward God. I, I guess I wonder if anybody's saying, could I kind of like be at this angle? Just I'm not completely turned away, but I'm. So that's what repentance looks like. I have a friend who's um, studying Hebrew and he emails me on occasion. And he said to me the other day, he says, the letters in the Hebrew word repent mean burn your house down. So it's saying that I've turned and I've burned it down. There's nothing to go back to. I'm going here. I'm done. There's nothing there to go back to. Yeah. Thank you, Joe. Appreciate it. So I'm a little interested. And the reason I'm interested is because this baptism was not really for Jews. It was for Gentiles who were converting to Judaism. So if you want to convert to Judaism as a Gentile, you need to immerse yourself you need to baptize in order to cleanse from all of your impurity. But that's not who John's calling. He's calling Jews. And he's saying to them, you've got to prepare for the coming of the Messiah because God is going to come and dwell among you and a holy God can only dwell among a holy people. I know I've said it lots of ways, but let me just put it here for you, okay? God calls us first to repentance for the forgiveness of sin. So earlier in the conversation when I was saying, is God calling you to do this? Is God calling you to do this? You may have been saying, I don't know what God's calling me to do. I'm trying to figure it out. If God is calling you to repentance, do that first. If there's something you need to repent of, do that first. And this wasn't just an individual confession. This was a communal confession. This, this was about the people of God coming and saying, God, forgive us. And I think there's a place for communal confession in our world today as believers, as followers of Jesus. So let's talk about how we move forward with this. Um, my, my wife, Annette, and I, we were out of town uh, for... Uh, during her birthday week. We were staying at a hotel and, and I went and found a flower shop uh, so that I could get her some flowers and put them in the hotel room and they would be there, you know, for her birthday week. I was kind of expecting a little bit of a, aw. Yeah. So I'll start over. So Annette and I were out of town <laughs> and I went to a flower shop and I got some flowers to bring to the hotel room so they could be there for her uh, her birthday week. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So I get to the counter with the flowers and, and I set the vase of flowers on the counter and the lady who is going to take my money looks at me and says, what'd you do this time? And, and not that it was true, but to be funny, I said, yeah, I'm in the doghouse. And an older guy standing there beside us said, it's going to take more than that to get you out of that doghouse. Now, the truth is, I wasn't in the doghouse, but the truth is, I've been in the doghouse many times. And there's been many times in my relationship with Annette where I've had to say to her, hey, I'm, I'm going the wrong direction with you. And, and I got to turn it around. And, and I need your forgiveness. I'm sorry for what I've done. And that's where John, the baptizer, says, that's where we ought to be. His shoes, I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. You understand, this was the role of a slave, not a disciple. And John says, no, 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 I'm not, I I'm not even worthy to do the job. I, I'm not worthy to get on my knees and untie his dirty sandals. He is so great. And then he goes on to say, I baptize with water. That's all I got, man. I got water, but he, he's not like me. He way, but he can baptize you with the Holy Spirit. He's going to change your life. You know what John's saying? The gifts of salvation and the gift of the Spirit are not mine to give. 
Only Jesus can do that. Only Jesus can forgive you of your sin. Only Jesus can fill you with his spirit. And, and then it just kind of gets a little bit confusing to most of us. Then Jesus shows up and he says, John, baptize me. And, and we're kind of going, what? You know, it's just, it's kind of, there's a lot of unanswered questions. It's a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sin, but Jesus had no sin, but he wants John to baptize him. And we're like, why would you get baptized? Because you don't have anything to repent of. You don't need any forgiveness. But Matthew really gets serious about it in his gospel. And John says, whoa, no, no, not gonna do that. I'm baptizing you, you should baptize me. And Jesus says, no, John, you should do it. And let us fulfill all righteousness in this moment. It's proper, it's fitting to do so. Jesus is the fulfillment of all righteousness. We don't really understand all of that like we wish we did, and we certainly don't understand why Jesus saw the heavens torn open. Something broke loose. You know what broke loose? All heaven broke loose. I got you, didn't I? But he's the only one that saw it as far as we can understand in the scripture. And then the voice from heaven, this is my son, we assume he's the only one that heard it. We don't understand why. There's so much we don't get, but there's one thing that we do get, and there's one question that Mark does answer, and this is the question that he answers, who is Jesus? And Mark says he is God's son. And in the story of the baptism, he says he is the Messiah. And what he's really saying is he is the only one who can forgive you of your sin He is the only one who can give you the spirit. So, repent for the forgiveness of sins and receive the salvation and the gift of the spirit. There's only one who can do that for you and me and us. So we enter into this very special moment. Would you retrieve the elements that you received when you walked through the door this morning? We practice open communion, meaning you don't have to be a member or even a regular attender of our church to receive communion. Here's what I would say to you. Only if you're sincerely seeking Jesus would you do this. It's not something for the faint of heart. And so what we believe in this moment is that we receive grace. We believe in this moment we can receive forgiveness. And so I got to think that maybe this is a great opportunity for many to confess sin and to ask for forgiveness. And then in a moment when you eat the bread and when you drink the cup, you take into your life the forgiveness that he's offering you. And so if you'll open the bread first, when Jesus was with his disciples, he took the bread and broke it. And he gave it to his disciples and he said, this is my body broken for you. All of you, eat it. And then he took the cup. And he said, this is my blood of the new covenant poured out for the ransom of many, the forgiveness of sins. In a sense, he was saying, drink and be forgiven. So let's everyone drink. Thank you, Father, for the provision of forgiveness that you have offered to us through your son, Jesus. We give you praise. We give you thanks. And give us the grace not to turn our backs on you. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
See you. 